All right. Oh, we're good. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're about one minute out till our session starts. Do we have our third presenter here? Our third in-person presenter? Anybody? Do I know who that is? You gonna make me call you out by name? Okay, hold on. Let's see here. Do we have Sung Min Jin? Sung Min? Going once? No? Oh wait, that's, yeah, he's supposed to be in person. Okay. All right, we'll find out. And everybody's here for the infrastructure management session, right? Great. <laughs> okay. okay. So. And you're all going to ask really hard questions, right? Really hard. Extremely. Like, yeah, complex. Okay, welcome everybody. It is 3.45 and in the interest of keeping us on time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. It is my great pleasure to chair the infrastructure session here at Visualization 2022. And we're gonna start off with the first of our great talks, the state of the art in BGP visualization tools by Justin Rayner at Northeastern. So Justin, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Justin Rayner from Northeastern University, and today I'm gonna to be presenting our paper, The State of the Art in BGP Visualization Tools, A Mapping of Visualization Techniques to Cyber Attack Types. Before I jump into the semantics of this domain, I just kind of wanted to give an overall preamble that we should think about these security problems a little bit more holistically. Um, so besides getting too, uh, too bogged down in the domain semantics, um, I just want us to kind of think of these problems as they might apply to other cybersecurity related um, uh, studies as well. So what is Border Gateway Protocol? Well, we all know that the internet is composed of several uh, thousand, hundreds of thousands actually, um, networks, uh, subnetworks, uh, and these subnetworks are composed of both routers and end systems, and a collection of those that are owned by the same entity are called autonomous systems. So you often hear that terminology uh, in the literature. With autonomous systems, each autonomous system actually defines their own routing policy um, independent of each other, and they take into account things like path optimization, peering relationships, and geopolitical considerations even. Um, and so we all know that there are several, uh, in fact, infinite ways of routing data through the internet. Um, and so each autonomous system has to decide what, where to send the data next. And BGP or Border Gateway Protocol is the mechanism that they use in order to make that, those decisions. So it's the mechanism that, that they use in order to get reachability information um, from their peers. So internet routing is largely dependent on border gateway protocol, but BGP continues to have inherent vulnerabilities and challenges that make comprehensive security infeasible and ineffective. And we consistently see attacks occurring uh, in the media on BGP. Um, uh, several of those are very recent. And this takes place because of a number of challenges. So one, uh, there's, BGP has a deep entrenchment and foundational role in the internet, meaning that it doesn't change very often. Upgrades are definitely very costly for a lot of organizations. Routing policy, as we talked about before, is complex and decentralized. Um, just a few BGP update messages provides uh, or spurs on thousands of, of update messages throughout the network. So we have voluminous amounts of data. Um, and incidents drastically vary in duration from seconds and minutes to hours and days. And some external challenges as well. So the increasing number of attacks on BGP, it increases every year, in fact. There's a growing dependency, obviously, from our society on uh, internet and network capabilities for goods and services. And other aspects of security implementations, such as RPKI or secure BGP, require a global buy-in. So even if one autonomous system implements these security measures, it's pretty ineffective unless uh, all of their peers do as well. 
So an attractive uh, interim solution to, uh, to BGP security happens to be visualization because of all of those challenges. Um, but if you look through the literature, there are countless numbers of implementations and tools that are available uh, for, for you to download and use. And so the question then becomes, what tool or technique is most effective given a specific attack? How do I know which tool to use? How do I know which techniques are going to be effective um, given particular attack metrics? So some early observations as we were putting our, our study together was that even though the data, users, and tasks were, uh, remained consistent across all of these tools, the implementations and the visualization techniques that they employ are vastly diverse. Um, studies tend to use previous or historic attacks for evaluation, which can be problematic from the perspective of best security practices. And some of the same attacks, in fact, are used as case studies to evaluate many different tools. So just some research questions that, uh, that we started our study with. Are the BGP visualization tools and techniques evolving with the threat? Is the use of historic attacks a valid evaluation mechanism? And what are the most used and underused techniques for particular attack types? So there are related, uh, related studies that have been conducted in the past, and I'm just listing a few of them here. Um, all of them, are, of course, are in our paper. Um, but they don't dig very deeply into the, the techniques themselves, into the visualization techniques. And they don't really touch at all on, on connecting those techniques with the attacks or the attack types. And that's what, we, what the goal of this study was, uh, was, was to do. So we, uh, we actually looked at 1,336 uh, papers for this study. Um, BGP is an enormous domain, and there are thousands and thousands of articles about it. We used a very rigorous inclusion criteria and came up with 29 example um, BGP visualization tools. Of, of course, our inclusion criteria is in our paper as well. And so I'm gonna walk through some of, uh, some of these outputs. So our first approach to this methodology um, was to categorize the tools by the, by the attack types and, and provide a temporal representation of them. So that's what we have here. In, uh, so we have all of the tools along the timeline, uh, when they were built, when they were published, and then the actual attacks categorized by their attack types and connecting the tools with those attacks. So we, can, we have several insights from this. For example, the focus of these tools seems to, to change over time from unknown to almost exclusively prefix hijacking. Um, and then, of course, outages, both logical and physical. Additionally, the number of attacks that are used to evaluate each, each tool seems to increase over time. And then, as we were saying before, there are certain historic attacks that seem to be used over and over again in the literature as evaluation for, the, for those tools. So once we categorized the tools by, uh, by the attack types, we then looked at the categorization by the visualization techniques that they employ, and we came up with statistics and frequency of those uses. So uh, here we can see the visualization technique, the frequency of their use uh, in this study, and then how it's combined with other techniques. And that's kind of something that's lacking in the literature is an understanding of how these uh, visualization techniques are combined to present the effect of, of being able to detect, identify, analyze these BGP attacks and incidents. So we can quickly see the top players, of course, node link uh, diagrams, timelines, uh, and maps as, as the overall players um, in this domain. Next, we looked at the visualization tasks and provided a task analysis. We identified 72 unique visualization tasks. We categorized them by, uh, by action and sub-action using Tamara Munster's task, uh, task taxonomy. And we can quickly see that the analysis and query actions are, are the greatest here with consume, identify, and produce as the top sub-actions, which is consistent in the literature that operators and expert users want a sense of automated features within their tools, but at the same time, they want to be in the process. They, 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 uh, they, they want to be able to have a stake in the identification analysis of attacks. Next, we went a step further with categorization, and we categorized each tool by the lower level techniques, the lower level visualization techniques that they provide, um, the combinations of those techniques to provide the effects that the tool promises, um, and we can see that as these are uh, listed in chronological order, how that's evolving over time. So just a couple of examples here um, from, uh, from our study. We uh, depict them using uh, these equations to show uh, the different, basically, combinations of visual techniques that are used. 
And then finally, once we have this uh, categorization of attack types, and we have the categorization of visualization techniques, we can then provide this mapping of techniques to, uh, uh, of techniques to attack types. And that's really the core of this paper, is connecting those two things together. Um, we believe that in the security realm, that grounding, uh, grounding the tools in this way um, is very important uh, to an understanding for design. And then finally, we offer this overall process and approach to security. So we believe that this provides a rich context for security visualization. Connecting the visualization techniques that we implement to the actual attack types is paramount. Um, and we provide a temporal understanding of how these tools are evolving to overall answer the question, are they evolving with the threat? And we also believe that, that different combinations of these products can be used in different ways to provide different insights. And that's kind of what we wanted to set up um, the next researchers for. And then finally, just a quick discussion on evaluation of security-related visualization tools. Evaluation in the security realm in terms of visualizations is difficult, and we all recognize that. Using previous and historic attacks goes against best security practices, and searching for something known does not give us a good indication of what we can find or what the unknown is. Um, and so we kind of poke at that uh, in this paper. Um, it's not always clear also what a user study means in this context because uh, many of the users of these tools are expert users or network operators. So, so user studies don't always make sense and we really do need to think through this problem even more. So with that, um, we do provide a formalization of visualization techniques for this domain, as well as an overall approach for security related tools. I'd like to thank all of my collaborators, uh, most especially my, my advisor, Cody Dunn. Thank you so much for, uh, for the support and for believing in me. And I would be remiss if I also didn't mention my wife and child, uh, Laura and Lyndon Rayner, who help me out at home every day. Uh, thank you so much and I'm happy to take your questions. All right, really nice presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions on Slido and I think we have time for both of them. Do you have any recommendations for visualization developers who need to design new visualizations in this space? Recommendations. Um, I would say that we really need to get back to talking with the operators. Um, I, I think that a lot of these visualization tools were developed in ways of like, what can we do with this data? And, uh, and how do we, you know, like what, what is the data telling us and how we should design this? We really do need to get back to a network operator level of understanding of what are the tasks that they wanna accomplish and, and how can we best do that from like a visualization design process? Great, and did you notice any interesting gaps in your categorizations that you think future tools could fill? I think that what our study shows is a preponderance of tools seem to use the same techniques. Um, and, and so there's a lot of overlap in those, uh, in those ways, even though the tools look pretty diverse uh, from a technique perspective. So it's, uh, we had the slide where we were showing kind of what that mapping looks like, and we can really see where the holes are and where the things that were used mostly um, reside. And so I do think that there is a lot of opportunity. A lot of these techniques are kind of textbook techniques though, and so I'm really interested in, in kind of pushing the boundaries of what we can do from a visualization perspective. That's definitely a future direction of this research. Great, the slide ties in nicely to the next question. Oh, okay. So we'll just leave sure. that up there. So <clears throat> we've got the nice column of visualization, but the question was, could you elaborate on some interaction techniques commonly seen in the linked visualizations in an attack analysis pipeline? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so there are some, some tools that started out as research projects. Um, so, so for an example of that, uh, or a canonical example of that would be like BG Play or BG Stream, BGP Stream. Um, and those have been kind of evolved into also like commercial products. Um, so the, there is a level of interaction in terms of like um, just basic kind of like clicking on things, um, getting details on demand and so forth, and being able to manipulate different views. Um, but we really haven't seen much beyond that. A lot of the tools are very much using those kind of basic interaction techniques. Great, that takes us to our time. Let's thank our speaker once more. Thank you. All right, and we're gonna switch gears to our virtual present <clears throat> presentation for R.I. Seer, inspecting the status and dynamics of regional industrial structure via visual analytics. Uh, the, pre <clears throat> the presenter today will be Longfei Chen, Long Fei, are you with us?
Hello, everyone. Today we are going to present our work, ICA, inspecting the status and the dynamics of regional industrial structure via visual analytics. We will present in four parts. First of all, IS means regional industrial structure, which represents the proportional in relationship between industrial sectors with different development functions in a specific range. The industrial structure is very important as it reflects the regional economic situation and development. Most of the current analysis of IS focus on two points. However, the previous works still have some limitations. For example, they lack the analysis of some key dimensions, such as the special temple dimension, and the current methods do not provide a good description of the internal structure of special clusters, which makes it difficult for researchers to assess the data in a comprehensive way. In order to optimize these limitations, we propose ICA by combining visualization methods and IS analysis. Our approach can be divided into three main phases, observational study, system design, and case study. In observational study, we first interviewed six domain experts from different fleets and combined their opinions to compare requirements at the industrial sector level and the gene special range level. An overview of our system is shown in the figure. Next, we will introduce the backend algorithm and the front-end visualization. Our backend can be divided into three parts. They are data description and processing, machine learning models for time series prediction, and spatial temporal clustering. This part is about the data description and processing. First, the collaboration with the domain experts provided us with a public available data set of business registration records covering the period from 1980 to 2015. Based on suggestions from domain experts, we developed and studied the following attributes of one company, address, start and end dates of operation, and some other basic information. Then, to understand the evolutionary pattern of RIS, we transformed the registration records into a time series dataset. We changed the index of the data from the main identity code of the enterprise to the date and construct a hash table to reorganize the original information. Next part is about model. We first divide the original dataset into three significant industries, namely primary, secondary, and tertiary industry. Then, we calculate the number of enterprises existing in each month. We use the data from 1980 to 1990 as the tra first training sets to predict the trend in 1991, followed by the data before 1991 as the training sets to predict the trend for 1992, and so on. In this work, we, we select two machine learning models, namely Random Forest and Charge Boost. We use a classical MAPE metric to evaluate the performance of the forecasting model. We further provide model explanations to help users understand the model performance and its differences in terms of feature importance. We choose sharp values to check the correlation between feature importance and prediction results. Two challenges exist in tracking the evolution of RIS over long periods of time and large geographic scales. First, correctly dividing long time periods is critical. Secondly, even if we manage to divide the evolution of RS into different intervals, for each interval, we are still confronted with a large amount of data. So it is important to abstract the characteristics of the corresponding enterprises. To address the first challenge, we formulate the partitionary of long periods as a segmentation problem. The effectiveness of the algorithm is shown in the figure. To address the second challenge, we analyze the business data from a cluster perspective rather than an individual perspective. We know for k-means, the determination of k is quite challenging, and for db-scan algorithm, it requires manual input of two parameters. The results directly depends on the user's parameter selection. Finally, we use KNN db-scan algorithm to automatically find a stable interval of cluster number variation by generating 
EPS and main points candidates. Now the spatial temporal clustering is finished. Our front end system is composed of five main wheels, which I will introduce in the following. First is the IS projection wheel. In the projection wheel, we slide the time by months, and each snapshot corresponds to one month of enterprise registration data with five dimensions. We use TSNE to reduce the five-dimensional data to two-dimensional plane. Users can view the specific time corresponding to snapshot by hover, and also can lasso to selected the interested time period for further analysis. Next is the registration prediction view. The three subplot from top to bottom correspond to three major industries respectively. We divide the enterprise registration data and use the machine learning model to predict the number of the enterprise registrations. From the figure, we can see the ground truth value and the predicted value. Moreover, to enhance the interoperability of the model, we introduce shaped value to reveal the importance of each feature in the data. Following is the IS evolution view and the special tempo view. Based on the predicted values, we use a time series segmentation algorithm to divide the IS evolution into several phases. Visually, we identicate the different time period with different colors. In the special tempo view, in order to display the information of different time period on a map, we use bubble sets of different colors. When users click the glyph on the map, more detailed information will appear. The glyphs in the special tempo view and the bars in the evolution view are one to one and to show the indicators of the regional clusters in different ways. In both views, we also want to capture the dynamics of the regional clusters. For an evolution path, the evolution wheel shows the number of involving enterprises and the distance traveled by the cluster centers, while the special tempo wheel shows the geographic information of the path. After exploring the overall distribution of regional clusters, we also design a regional comparative view to support users in understanding the difference between regional clusters. Due to the application scenario, we enhance the traditional radar plots by calculating the indicator distribution based on geographic clustering. In addition, our system is designed with a path comparative view to assist users in comparing different IS evolution paths. Now we show one case study. In this case, we show how experts use Receer to explore Shenzhen's enterprise's registration records for the past more than 30 years. First of all, the experts loaded a total of 1.1 million enterprises' registration and cancellation activities of Shenzhen over the past 30 years into Receer. Risk projection view slices and projects the high-dimensional data onto 2D plane. After expert tool assoed on this view, the registration prediction view predicted the enterprise's registration data within the corresponding time range. Expert 1 observed that the number of enterprises in Shenzhen grew very fast from 1993 to 1998. After the experts identified the period of interest from 1993 to 1998, Expert 2 moved to the risk evolution view, focusing on the path corresponding to that period. By hovering on multiple evolving paths, the experts found that two of them showed a trend of merging during this period. The experts then clicked on each cluster glyph, looked at the geographical coverage through the heat map, and found that the starting areas of the two paths are in Hengang District and Longgang District, respectively. The experts pointed out these two districts were merged due to administrative planning before 1993. In addition to observing the above phenomenon of the risk path evolving and merging, the experts also wanted to explore how the regional industrial structure evolves along a risk path. Particularly, Expert 1 relocated a risk path, selected several regional clusters along the path in chronological order, and added them to the cluster comparison view for further comparison. Expert 1 witnessed that with time, the registered capital, the livability, and the credit rating of regional enterprises are all improving, which shows that the industrial development situation of the region shows a good momentum.
By taking a closer look at the information of each cluster, the experts found that the financial sector and the region is gradually occupying a dominant position over time. Compared with the previous works, RCR can effectively display the phenomenon of industrial aggregation, radiation, and migration. It also allows users to dynamically select specific areas and track changes in the companies within that area. We discussed with experts about the generalized ability and scalability. They said that the system is already very versatile and can be applied to any region if the data is pre-processed beforehand. Also, other economic data, such as GDP, can be easily integrated into ICR. In the future, we plan to expand our approach to a broader scope, use more change-friendly time series prediction models, and to perform city-level comparisons to capture dynamic RS evolution patterns. Okay, we have time for one short question. Thanks for joining us, Long Fei. So, from Eric Young, could you tell us why did you use random forest and XG boost models for prediction? Did you use other machine learning models? Mm, okay, um, uh, this is a very good question. Um, as we know, uh, there are many representative time series forecasting models available for the evaluation, um, such as uh, uh, ARIMA. Uh, VAR, LSTM, and others. Uh, they cover both uh, linear and nonlinear methods, mm, but some of them uh, pro perform poorly in terms of uh, interoperability. Uh, therefore, we do some experiments on the models to test their prediction ac accuracy and uh, interoperability. And finally, we, do, uh, we choose uh, the random forest and the charge boost since they have better results in our experiments. In our paper, we have discussed this question in the experiment part. Uh, I think if you are interested in, uh, you can read it to find more details. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's thank our speaker one more time. And there's another question. If you want to go to Discord, it'll be put there. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> All right, we're just getting the mic set up for the next speaker. So we have our... Sure, thank you. Take your time, Valentine. Yeah, if somebody wants the handheld, if somebody wants the handheld when they speak, they can have it too. It doesn't matter to me. We're flexible here. All right. Ready for our third talk. Um, this is PMU Tracker, a visualization platform for epicentric event propagation analysis in the power grid, led by Anjana Arun Kumar from Arizona State University. So looking forward to this talk. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anjana, and I'll be talking about our system, PMU Tracker. So to start with, let's take a look at the power grid. So the North American power grid is a vast network that serves millions of consumers every day. And electricity supply is done in three broad stages. First, the power plants generate electricity. Then it's sent across long distances using transmission lines, towers, and transformers. And finally, local facilities, that is substations, distribute powers to various consumers, that is the nearby homes and businesses. But things can go wrong with power supply. For example, many of us might have experienced power blackouts or voltage fluctuations. And such anomalous behavior is termed as an event in the grid. And in general, grid events occur when there is a failure in some sort of grid network component, like a transformer. And the effects can then propagate across the network. Grid operators are responsible for identifying when such events happen and figuring out why through real-time monitoring. And based on this, they follow standard control protocols that aim at mitigating the event's impact and sometimes also to prevent future such events from occurring. So the devices that are used to continuously monitor the grid's power transmission are PMUs, or phaser measurement units. These are basically smart sensors that provide fast, precise, and time-synchronized measurements of power transmission characteristics like voltage or current at rates of about 30 to 120 hertz. PMU readings are usually viewed as line charts of streaming time series data. And operators basically monitor the grid by comparing the PMU readings against the network topology. 
Next, we come, come to event epicenters. So here, the failed transformer is the cause of a blackout. So the PMU highlighted here monitors the line that connects the transformer to the place where the blackout occurs. So we can term that as the epicenter PMU. But when an event occurs, it's not very easy always to localize its source and epicenter in the grid. And this is basically because the grid components are highly interconnected with multiple PMUs producing noisy data. So an operator essentially has to comb through multiple PMUs resulting in high overhead. So here's an example of an industrial system. So there's a set of line charts and a map to analyze the PMU data, plus some glyphs that show event characteristics. But manually matching basically supports a top-down perspective as opposed to localizing an event. And as a result, we develop PMU tracker. So this basically allows grid network exploration, uses signal processing to localize the epicenter of a grid event, and then you can juxtapose other PMUs against your epicenter. And finally, use a novel cluster dendrogram to track the propagation of the event across the grid network. So we use a real-world data set that comprises 500 PMUs over a three-year period from a regional US electric company. But we've anonymized the data throughout the paper. Um, the PMUs in our data set record uh, magnitude and phase measurements for voltages and currents at 30 hertz. So here's an initial look at our interface. Our primary design requirements were elicited by surveying experienced practitioners in US power companies. So we support flexible data retrieval to analyze PMU data at different granularities, link um, potential epicenters to events either automatically or manually, um, support the tracing of sub-second uh, event occurrences in our temporal analysis, and finally we design uh, multiple coordinated views that can uh, discover events, track their propagation in the network. So the raw data we have is saved using the Parquet file format which supports column-wise retrieval. And additionally, the columns are subdivided by timestamp into 15-minute row groups. So this allows for specialized high-performance queries in order to support the network and scale up. So our data analysis pipeline essentially stems from the detection and monitoring of oscillation events. These basically manifest as power fluctuations, and it can happen when a generator has imperfect control on the power supply. But if these aren't resolved very quickly, it fluctuates to very high values, causes equipment failure and a blackout in the grid. So an important task is therefore to very quickly localize an oscillation source and resolve the event. So when we look at PMU voltage magnitudes during those oscillation events, we find that the oscillations are the most prominent and clean near the epicenter. And as we get further away, they become much noisier with damped magnitude. But before we get into how to use this characteristic to localize um, the event, there's one more term that needs to be defined that is hops. This is basically the number of physical links that connect a PMU to the epicenter. So for instance, this is the epicenter, then that's one hop away and three hops away. So uh, for event localization, we use FFT. And FFT is basically can um, convert to information from the time domain to the frequency domain. So we can get the peak voltage magnitude of the fluctuation, as well as the frequency with which it occurs, termed as the oscillation frequency, to gauge the severity of the event. And looking at the relative FFT magnitudes across PMUs, we can localize the anomalous PMUs of interest for further analysis. So a quick walkthrough of our interface here. Um, please see our paper for a more detailed explanation. So we essentially have seven linked panels, six of which I'm showing right now. Um, so we have the controls for event analysis parameters, the grid network structure. We show the oscillation frequency for a time period selected and then FFT plots for um, analysis of the individual PMUs, a TSME to cluster them, and finally our novel dendrogram view that analyzes the effects of an event as it propagates through the network. So consider a simple case study now. Um, so for a voltage oscillation event, uh, once you've customized your initial temporal analysis parameters, you load the network view. And the intensity of the colored contour basically gives you a high level view of the regions exhibiting um, high oscillatory behavior. So based on this, you can select your initial set of PMUs. So here we have nine that are flagged for analysis out of a total 20 selected. So we take a closer look at FFT magnitudes. And in doing so, what we see is that the sharpest peak occurs at 2.5 hertz. So we can take that to be the oscillation frequency. And when we categorize the constituent PMUs, we see that the nine flagged PMUs all show very high magnitudes of fluctuation. And looking further and matching that against the map, we see that the PMU-122 at the Yearling substation has the highest peak and is a possible candidate for the epicenter of the oscillation event that's going on. 
So we initially um, clustered the PMUs and we've annotated with rings to see the hop distance from the epicenter. So the nine flagged PMUs are all in the central cluster, very close to the epicenter. But when we drill down, we see that some PMUs one hop away don't show higher FFT values and they're located on lower voltage lines. So we can conclude that for this particular event, the PMUs that are situated on higher voltage lines going out from our candidate epicenter are probably the ones we should be focusing on. So that's when we come to the dendrogram view. So we initially set, select a set of PMUs with the candidate epicenter 122 as our root node. We use a combination of k-means and hierarchical clustering to group the PMUs and juxtapose them against the epicenter. So each successive layer shows the hop distance from our candidate epicenter. And each cluster individually contains statistics about the types of transmission lines, PMUs present, a box plot to show the distribution of FFTs against each other, and the FFT magnitudes themselves. So overall, the thicker flows and the darker nodes that you see here um, indicate that those um, clusters of PMUs have higher oscillatory behavior. And as we move along, you also see the oscillation frequency from the FFT magnitude charts decreasing from 2.5 hertz to 0.5 hertz, with the furthest PMUs five hops away from the epicenter. So this basically means that the oscillation, is a, when it's occurring, gets damped top, when you go topologically further away from the epicenter. So based on this, to try and confirm that our candidate epicenter is correct, we um, reinitialize the dendrogram with the new um, epicenter. So this is basically PMU211, which is one hop away from the, our current candidate. And uh, when we look at high voltage lines that are going out of this um, PMU, we see that the high voltage lines display like very high anomalous behavior, while lower voltage lines or lines located in substations further away show decreased activity. And therefore we can conclude that 122 is in fact probably the epicenter for this event. So this panel essentially streamlines PMU selection and analysis for event identification and pro propagation tracing particularly when compared to the manual mapping that needs to be used in current industrial monitoring inter interfaces. And the flexibility in being able to change the epicenter of this dendrogram also potentiates future event discovery. We have a case study for that as well in the paper, so please refer to that for more details. So in conclusion, PMU Tracker supports the visual identification, analysis, and propagation tracking of events in the power grid. And our novel dendrogram technique in particular streamlines event tracing to support high-level insights for operators. Um, however, we do require significant backend engineering to fully integrate with real world monitoring systems which will have streaming data. And additionally, a priori event flagging is not currently supported. It requires the integration of several other data streams like weather reports, social media data, et cetera. So future work uh, could possibly include testing our system on additional time varying topological domains, integrating um, other statistics from deep learning and supporting the tracking of concurrent events that might occur in the grid. Thank you. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions now. Great, we've got time for just one question um, from Slido. Did you consider aggregating nodes in your graph? Um, yes, but uh, what we realized is that when we aggregate nodes, um, given the size of like our current um, panels, it gets really, really cluttered. And if you try to reduce like the time scale and aggregate that way, you lose some of the event characteristics because there are sub-second anomalies that are being like analyzed. All right, let's thank our speaker for their great talk. <laughs> All right, next we're switching back to virtual. We've got Su Huan Liu <clears throat> presenting e -coal Viz visual analysis of control strategies in coal-fired power power plants. So we can go ahead and take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Shu Han from Zhejiang University. Today I'll present a latest paper from our group, Ecovis Visual Analysis of Control Strategies in Co-Filed Power Plants. Coal is one of the world's largest energy sources for electricity generation. It contributes over one-third of the electricity generated in 2021, but it also causes serious environment problems. To reduce the consumption and pollutant emissions of coal, the efficiency of the existing coal-fired power plants need to be improved. The control strategy is one of the major factors affecting the efficiency. It comprises a sequence of control valve adjustments and state changes. All control valves and states are monitored by thousands of sensors and recorded as time series data. For example, 
The burner and the day superheater are two typical control valves, and the temperature is a kind of state. First, turn up the burner so the temperature increases. When the temperature exceeds a certain threshold, the day superheater starts working. Finally, the environment reaches the most suitable temperature. Under such temperature, the efficiency is high. As shown in the example, the experts wonder how to set the threshold and how about the time lag between the change and the adjustment. Moreover, which control valves and states will be influenced? How about the order of the events? Thus, to understand optimized control strategies is important. Traditionally, control strategies are analyzed and evaluated manually by experts with professional software. However, these methods are poorly scalable and time-consuming. Many data-driven approaches were proposed by modeling and simulating a power plant, but most of them are based on limited data sets and strong assumptions. Or existing approaches do not combine human intelligence well with machine computing power. Therefore, we propose equal ways to visually analyze the control strategies of coal-fired power plants. The system helps users first to describe relationships among time series and extract the desired control strategies. Then, users can analyze the impact of control strategies through a dual mode graph view. Finally, a spatial temporal visualization supports time-lag-aware analysis, and users can inspect the raw data. However, developing such a solution poses the following three challenges. The first step of analyzing control strategies is to extract it. However, extraction of control strategies is challenging. The largest scale sensor data requires an efficient search algorithm. Besides, the diversity and dynamics require the interactive integration of domain knowledge. Next, the impact of control strategies must be intuitively visualized. This helps experts understand how such impact propagates and affects the efficiency. However, the power plant is a complex system with numerous components and multiple levels of hierarchies, so producing an intuitive graph layout is important. Third, time lag is crucial to the analysis of control strategies because the order and timing of control valve adjustments heavily depend on these time lags. However, analyzing time lag is challenging, since time lags are tightly integrated with the complex cascading impact. To address these challenges, we collaborated with the domain experts and summarized the two types of analysis tasks based on the direction between causes and effects. In the forward analysis, the experts need to determine the cascading impact of diverse control strategies and the efficiency. In the backward analysis, the experts would like to find anomalies in several critical sensors and identify the control strategy responsible for these anomalies. To develop the system supporting these two analyses, we further discuss with experts and conclude five user requirements. In particular, requirement one and two are for the forward and backward analysis, respectively, and requirement three to five are for both. To support these user requirements, we design a system with four views and an extraction algorithm. For the first requirement, we design the future view and support forward queries. Users specify desired control strategies through the input panel. We design an event glyph with user concern details like workflow stages, sensor types, and trends, so we can represent the query as a sequence of events. Then the backend will start forward queries and search for complete control strategies. As the complete control strategy is complex, the model should fuzzy measure the given partial strategy and find the cascading impact. First, we discretize sensor time series into event sequences. Then we align the sensor events. Finally, the fuzzy matching can be formulated as the longest common subsequence problem. So we use a classical dynamic programming approach. Then users could select a complete control strategy through the banking panel. Each row shows an alternative control strategy. The pie chart reveals the matching score. This alternative matches four events and misses two events. The summary row reveals the number of all answers and how many alternatives support this strategy. For the second requirement, we use a line plot. Users could select the time range in which there is a significant change. Opacity encoding helps highlight the critical areas that change first. 
Then, in the back was curious. The model need to expand from the given sensor to find the responsible control strategy for the anomaly. We design a five-step search algorithm to support backward queries. More details, please refer to our paper. For the third requirement, we provide both spatial and contextual information about the co-filed power plant. This is because the relationship-oriented layout reduces ambiguities and shows the relationship concisely. However, the experts are unfamiliar with it. Hence, we adopt a context-oriented layout to help them locate critical senses. In both layouts, we adopt node link diagram design. Nodes represent different senses, while edges depict the strength of correlation and the direction. For the requirement for we design strategy view, we first visualize the topology of the control strategy. It reveals the order and direction of cascading impact. Next, each row of the bar chart displays the time series data of the sensor. We align the time series to highlight the visual pattern. Thus, users can gain insights into the exact time lag and how the cascading impact propagates. Also, users can explore the control strategy through editing. For the requirement 5, we design detailed view to assist to users inspecting detailed raw data on demand. We invite the experts to evaluate ECOVIS on one real-world historical data set. Here we will show the first usage scenario. The first case shows the backward analysis scenario. Bob first observed that the power generation efficiency increased during the period and reached a stable state. Therefore, he brushed this period with anomaly to find a responsible cause control strategy. After the backend algorithm extracted the control strategy, Bob started to explore graph view. Attracted by the highlighted circles in furnace, which is the most important component of coal-fired power plants, Bob clicked the circles to analyze. He found that the impact propagated from furnace to cinder and finally efficiency. Besides, he found that there was still a highlighted sensor in the fan, which was only related to the wind circulation. Therefore, he guessed that this anomaly might be related to the wind circulation. To figure out how and why the fan was adjusted, Bob went to strategy view to further analyze link and time lag details. He first clicked the add button to expand the fan node, but got an unexpected sensor. Therefore, he deleted it to get a full control strategy. He found that after one minute, the total air volume setting was reduced, the fan decreased accordingly, then after another two minutes, the dampers in furnaces were affected to increase. Finally, the carbon content of fly ash decreased and the power generation efficiency increased. Based on these observations, Bob thought that the reason why the efficiency increased might be reducing excess air in the furnace. Then Bob went to detail view to inspect more evidence. He aligned the time lag and observed that oxygen remained stable overall, while others changed accordingly, which was consistent with the previous algorithm inference. Finally, Bob wanted to know how many times this adjustment happened in history to evaluate this control strategy. He imported it into filter view and found the support value was 64%. In summary, our contributions include formulating a framework and characterizing the user requirements, designing an interactive approach, developing ECOVIS, and evaluating it. In the future, we will simplify ECOVIS by adding guidance, integrate a 3D schema, connect it to the streaming data, and adapt for in-suit analysis. We would like to thank the funding agencies for their generous support. That concludes my presentation. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. All right. Really nice presentation. Thank you. If we have any questions, please go ahead and add them to Slido, but I'll go ahead and get started. Um, can your system be applied to other coal-fired power plants? Uh, um, yes. Our system can be used in a variety of co-filed power plants and only requires users to pre-process the data according to the guidelines before use. We have given the pre-processing goals and instructions on our data page. Great. And do you think this could be applied to other industrial problems, whether it's wastewater management, um, supply chain networks, or other sorts of things in this space? Uh, I think uh, maybe it is also important to display time lags when visualizing cascading impact 
or workflow for those industries that are closely related to control. So uh, the methods of querying time lag aware patterns based on the relationships between time series might be helpful. All right, well, that takes us to the end of this time. Let's thank our speaker and get the next one set up. That's Singman, do you want this? All right, just give us one minute while we get set up. That was for the online people. The in-person people can tell what's going on. All right, welcome to the fifth talk of our session. Uh, this will be presented by Sung Moon Jin and Hien Wook Lee. They're talking about a visual analytics system for improving attention-based traffic forecasting models. Take it away, guys. Uh, hello? <laughs> okay, just keep going. <laughs> no? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, without you have to change the you have to
appreciate that. Was it five weeks or one thing? I can't get out of this presentation. Um, Just stop. Sure. <laughs> oh, it's going to be worse. <laughs> Are going to present our paper named a visual analytic system for improving attention-based traffic forecasting model. Thanks for the help of all co-authors and my advisor, Song An Ko. The traffic forecasting is crucial part of the urban planning, but traffic condition changes with many other factors such as date, time, weather, events, and even with traffic signals. Recently, researchers are trying to model traffic condition with deep learning models. Deep learning model make it easy and accurate on average with a bunch of data during the model and get accurate results on average. So our question is, is it enough to deploy for real world application? When we conduct the interview with the navigation developer, we heard their working process and challenges. First of all, they mentioned that negative samples are much important than positive samples. But because of the complex, complex dependency of data, it is hard to find them and make model be better in negative cases. They also suffered from the black box problem. Even worse, they currently do not utilize visualization. Lastly, to improve their model in such cases, they retrained model every single settings and checked their performance iteratively. It seems to be hard to find both reasons for failure and optimal solution. We can summarize three main challenges in their work as the complex dependency of data itself and black box problem of deep learning model and heavy training and tuning costs to find the optimal solution. This is a traffic speed of the real road in Los Angeles. It contains 80% of the easy task and 20% of hard task. For most of the model, they easily predict future speed, but they often struggle to make good solution for negative cases. However, there exist, there exist challenges to solve this problem. For the case study and analysis task, because of the complex dependency, it is hard to find negative samples and analyze data. Black box problem make it harder to analyze model behavior. When they try to find a better solution, heavy debugging costs hinder their job and compare them to spend their resources. So in our work, we solve these three obstacles with corresponding questions when and where does a model produce inaccurate prediction? Why does model fail to forecast traffic condition? And how can you improve model performance without retraining? In our work, we provide solution with visual analytic system for the attention model. Next, Sungmin will introduce our system and explain case study. Our key approach is decomposing the model's behavior with explainable visual components to understand the characteristics and the dependence of roads. Since we have a huge size of road networks, we start from the mean absolute error filter to find out interesting points. We also use the filter for the dependencies so that we may focus on the important ones. To understand the characteristics of, of each road, we utilize a table that contains various information such as daily speed trend, histogram, mean absolute error, cluster, and grand causality F score. Users may sort this table using each column to compare characteristics. Line chart provides the function to compare the speed and predictions of multiple loads. This is especially useful when users confirm the preceding information in dynamics. The preceding information is a series of signals with a certain time lags and windows. We can visually validate the model's behavior by how well it captures this kind of information in the predictions.
We encoded the dependency information using attention matrix and attention arrows. These two are linked to each other and the information is extracted from the model using multiplications. DTW plays a key role in our analysis, since DTW distance allows to capture similarity of trend even with the various time lags. It is mainly used to provide a summarized attention matrix of model's behavior. Since uh, spatial information is in traffic data is huge, clustering spatial dependency using DTW greatly reduces the searching time in analysis. We encoded this cluster information on the map as a dotted color, and also listed in the table. We also support the Granger Coloriality test to confirm the preceding information with F score. We will show the details in the next section with the case study example. We introduced two interesting case studies that compare different road networks, urban and highway. These networks have different characteristics in terms of speed, which may affect the spatial or temporal dependency. However, in terms of the model's behavior, we found that they share common issues. The analysis consists of two steps to understand the model's behavior, identifying the characteristic of roads, and analyzing spatial temporal dependency. Here we explain the analyzing steps using urban road networks since they share the same issue for the model's behavior. After that, we will shortly introduce the main point of the characteristic on the highway road network. In the first step, users need to identify where and when the error happens by adjusting the MA filter. As you see, the higher errors are located in the intersection area where traffic joins are split in both road networks. We use the terms a high error for the third the MA quartile above. These roads have specific speed pattern in the line chart with the high fluctuations, the strong noise. Uh, since high fluctuation of speed indicate the high distributions, we can quickly confirm the positive correlations between the variational and errors by sorting the table. Hist Histocam also showed the difference of patterns between high and low error cases. In the second step, users want to understand what's going on in the inference of these predictions by analyzing attention metrics, attention arrows, and the head cause metrics. As you see, when the error is low, the model focuses on few reference loads, including itself. However, when the error is high, the number of reference loads increase. This behavior causes the model to be less sensitive to important information such as self-reference. Beside this problem, we can notice that the model focuses on inefficient reference when we use the Granger quality test. You can see that the load 113 does not focus on the 112, even though this load is in the same DTW cluster and the head is Granger causality. Head cluster matrix shows the summarized result of our findings. Here, x axis is the aggregated attention of uh, predicting load by clusters, and y axis is the reference loads. At the global scale, both roads network lose the intensity of the attention, especially with the diagonal patterns. This means that the model loss focus on similar clusters or self-reference at high error. You can also notice that the impact is much more severe at highway load networks, since highway relies on the diagonal patterns a lot. This indicates that even though highways are easier to predict than urban load network in general because of low variation of speed, it could be much more difficult to predict when the high speed fluctuation happens. Now we have found why, then how to improve performances with these findings. The answer is impulse attention to be user's intention. As we can see in case study, user found differences in attention patterns for high error case and low error case. The model lost their attention in high error case. Then, User selects some of them, in this case, cluster 3, to revise the attention. In this cluster, the error rate is very high and model fails to get sufficient information for prediction. After user select target, user imports attention with their intention, like strengthen self attention of cluster, cluster 3. Now, user have imports attention with strengthen self attention. Now, system provides the comparison of the original results and imports the results. As we can see, imports one gonna be much better than the original one. It is much concrete if we check changes of the error distribution. This is how attention analyzer provides how to improve model without retraining or tuning. After showcase of the our system, we got some feedbacks from experts. They give happy comments with all of the when and where and why and how. 
they seem delightful for our system's exploration and overview of the attention pattern with clustering and replacement of the attention, but they also suggest other concerns to be considered, like, first of all, our system may mainly discuss relationship among the road, so there is less temporal analysis with map view and attention. Secondly, when they, when they provide navigation service, they mainly focus on the local network like route rather than the global network. Our system could give overview of the global road network, but it doesn't focus on the local specific area of the road network. For the takeaway, we summarize our contribution. Two is analysis on the complex dependencies. We suggest visual analytic system to handle them. For the black box problem, we connect attention pattern with two automated methods, dynamic time warping and Granger causality test. Finally, we suggest attention enforcement, which can improve model performance in negative cases without heavy debugging cost. There are another takeaway for future works. As we shown, change or missing of the attention pattern can alert undesired hard situation. We could utilize them for anomaly detection or interchange of the model. Furthermore, lightweight methods like Granger causality test can help complex and heavy model. It could give a hint for the ensembling or provide, providing better service for traffic problem. Lastly, as its expert concerned, this work could be extended to ETI tasks. Specifically, local road network center visualization could be one of our future work. This is the end of our presentation. If you are interested in our paper or want to discuss about the future work, feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. All right, we'll take one quick question. Do you guys have any thoughts on how to incorporate error in forecast estimates more explicitly in your UI? Could you repeat your question? I mean, Do you have any thoughts on how to incorporate error in forecast estimates more explicitly in your user interface? How might you help us show the errors better? Any thoughts? No, it's uh, if the data is a special temporal uh, features, I think is uh, it, our system will work in the same time like that. Mm, I, I think so. <laughs> All right, well, let's thank our speakers one more time. <laughs> and this takes us to the final talk of the session. We have RCM Biz, a visual analytics system for root choice modeling. The speaker will be Dong Hua Shin, and he'll be presenting virtually. Hello, everyone. I'm Dong Hua Shin from Seoul National University in South Korea. In this presentation, I will talk about RCM Beach, a visual analytics system for root choice modeling. When bicycle riders travel from an origin to a destination, they can choose various routes. In this situation, which route do riders usually take? To answer this question, urban planning researchers perform an analysis called root choice modeling using the rider's actual trip records. The main idea of RCM is that the more taken route's characteristics will be more preferred. By collaborating with urban planning researchers, we were able to understand their domain analysis scenarios. I will briefly show their analysis process that our system should support. In actual analysis scenarios, there exist many origins and destinations, and many flows between OD pairs. To understand the data, researchers often explore geographical distribution of traffic. Then, they can filter out the data to get the data to be analyzed. Before modeling the data, researchers need to perform the data processing step. Each OD pair has multiple routes between origin and destination, but in most cases, there are too many routes for modeling. To pick the representative routes, routes with similar characteristics could be clustered. This process is called choice set generation. Since the result of choice set generation can vary greatly depending on the hyperparameter setting, 
Researchers iteratively check the result of numerous settings to find well-clustered results. Choice set generation is done in every OD pairs in the data, respectively. After generation, model estimation is done by fitting the model to all the root choice records. In this step, researchers decide which root attributes to be estimated using their domain knowledge. The modeling results can vary depending on this attribute selection. After the estimation, we can figure out which attributes are preferred by inspecting the model coefficient. According to this sample result, roots with a shorter distance or high primary load ratio are more preferred. More than just knowing the resulting statistics, researchers can explore which region or OD pairs especially support the modeling result. They can use this data level understanding of the model for dealing with various urban planning issues. Based on this analysis scenario, we establish a three-stage analysis framework for root choice modeling. In the exploration stage, users explore and filter data to get a subset of data to be analyzed. In the modeling stage, users generate choice sets and estimate models under numerous hyperparameter settings. They can also compare the modeling results of different settings. In the reasoning stage, users interpret the modeling results at the data level, such as OD pairs or trips, to gain insight into the modeling results. Now I will show you the visual design of our system. The data used for this study was a real-world bicycle trip dataset from the Seoul bike sharing system. It contains bicycle riders' movement trajectory records between public bicycle stations. The main goal of the exploration stage is to explore and prepare dataset for the next modeling stage. Here is the visual interface for the exploration stage of our system. Users can apply filters to the dataset using OD trip view and OD bubble plot. The applied filters are represented as batches of the header. The filtering results are rendered in the map view and the station view. Users can identify the geographical distribution of the bicycle travels in the form of the flow map. Each station is represented as a row of the station view. So, users can check the traffic and various characteristics of each station. If users want to check the actual route of riders travel, then the route view shows the trajectories and their attributes in a single OD pair. After the dataset is decided, we can now model riders route choice behaviors in the modeling stage. Initially, we need to generate choice sets for every OD pair. So, we provide interface for choosing the attributes and method combinations used for the choice set generation. Then, the results are displayed in the table. Users can identify the correlation between the chosen hyperparameters and the quality of the generated choice sets. After that, users can select the modeling attribute sets and start estimating their coefficient. The model view shows the result of the model estimation. Each row of the table represents a single modeling result. Because we estimate lots of choice sets and modeling attributes combinations, we have to compare them using the two major quality indices. The results are rendered in the form of the scatter plot. We can identify from many modeling results that Riders prefer primary and secondary loads. Note that the bike lane ratio are not significant in this model result. But interestingly, if we do not include primary and secondary road ratio in the modeling attributes, then the bicycle lane ratio becomes highly significant. It means riders prefer bike lanes when they are traveling. Our domain experts said that this result could be due to the correlation between the attributes. 
it shows why we need to perform and compare many modeling measures from the various hyperparameters. If users choose one of the model of their interest, then they can move on to the reasoning stage. In the reasoning stage, we can explore the selected modeling results with the same interface in the exploration stage. But unlike the exploration stage, there is a model view at the top showing the information of selected modeling results. The selected model informs that riders tend to prefer a shorter route with a smaller number of intersections, and they also prefer a primary road and do not prefer routes with many upslopes. To explore the data supporting this result, we define the index called estimation contribution score, which can measure how a specific OD pair contributes to the resulting model coefficient. We will inspect OD pairs with high estimation contribution score for loop distance. When only such OD pairs are left, we first inspect the station with the highest traffic. This station is located in the university area. From this, we can infer that many students move from the university to the subway station by taking short route. This was our system design and some of the use cases. If you want to find the detailed information of our visualizations or more use cases, please refer to our paper. Finally, I end this presentation by summarizing the main contribution of this paper. We design and develop RCM Beach, a visual analytics system with a three-stage interactive modeling framework for effective load choice modeling. And we also identify and abstract the domain situation of load choice modeling analysis. Last, we evaluate RCM Beach through a case study of a real-world bicycle travel dataset. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Great, let's thank our speaker. All right, we have one question from Slido, um, more of an explanation question here. The data set contains rides from many different riders. However, it seems that you build a single route choice model, thus assuming that all riders have the same route choice model. Did we understand this correctly? Uh, yes. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for the nice question. And uh, yes, um, we only use a path size logic model and K-middle is clustering method for choice set generation. Uh, but in this paper, we focus on um, exploring parameter space of the method and in, maybe, I think, incorporating other models uh, uh, will be good idea and maybe that can be good future work. Oh, thank you. And did you think about combining all three stage views into one view? Yeah, I thought about that. and. In the first prototype, we actually did all the three stage view, uh, views in one uh, three stage in one view, but uh, we had to uh, users have to perform various tasks for tasks, so uh, we decided to split the views into the tab. Great. Well, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and thank our presenter. All right, let's have one more round of applause for all the authors. Thanks everyone for the great presentations today. Okay.